Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see all of you again. Smiling faces. I look forward to seeing you folks. You know, it's like Wednesday's a highlight. It's supposed to be my day off, but it's like I'm going to have a love in with a bunch of friends. Um, so today we're going to carry on with where we were working last week and the week before. And I think so that we create a segment about problematic parenting um, as we experienced it, all right? Maybe I'm just going to keep it a whole segment because I have had a lot of requests for the next in the series, the logical sequence. And that is, um, if people can see, um, narcissistic fathers and the effect. And we're going to do some, it'll probably be only one segment on if the narcissistic fathering was to the extent that it actually created complex post-traumatic stress for you. This is a, a slightly lighter version, narcissistic fathers and just the effect all right. Um, and remember, narcissism um, is a spectrum disorder. So you can have a little, you can have a lot. All we're, we're not looking to find fault. We're not looking to diss our parents. All we're looking to do is to see where that feeling of I'm not enough is. And I don't know my needs because there was no point in having any. The other person's needs were always paramount. That's going to get in your way now as it relates to clutter and hoarding, right? You may be on a spectrum. If you're attending today, you probably are. And so it's about learning about ourselves, not pointing the finger at other people, but to understand how we process and, and the baggage we've been left with you kind of need to drill down, and some of it may sound like finding fault. That's not the purpose. And then we're going to do one or two sessions on recovery. Because as I do each segment with you now, I think, as I said last week, I think to be responsible, I need to make sure that there are some strategies for if you're at the higher end of the spectrum if your parenting was extremely narcissistic and damaging, all right, one or both of your parents. I don't want to open up a wound and then leave you without any devices to help you manage it, all right? If that's happening, please let me know by emailing me because then I would want to kind of incorporate some other Maybe, you know, when we're in a touchy topic that really resonates beyond my expectation, maybe we'd have like a half hour where those people could join in and we could do a little bit of problem solving, debriefing and strategy development. Okay, I don't want to leave anybody hanging in pain. Okay, so little bit of reminder because we do have some new people this week and I don't want anyone left behind. Remember we talked last week about regardless of what level of narcissism existed in your family, little to lots, the first thing you need to do is to save yourself. You're an adult right now, all right? Keeping the mindset of a child by expecting someone to come to meet your needs or hoping, hoping for something that its time has passed. All right. The only person who can heal that now is you. If your parents are still alive and they're motivated and it was significant enough for you, perhaps if they're motivated, but only if they're motivated. Perhaps there is some meeting of the mind and healing that could be done, but that may be an unrealistic expectation, or perhaps your parent is past. And in the recovery, we're going to talk about if your parent is past, 
then how can you heal yourself? And there are some strategies because there's no person in the world, myself included, who was perfectly always parented. All right. We all take a few knocks and bruises along the way by being misunderstood or whatever the situation, the context was. First point, remember, the plane's going down or you're hitting bumpy air space in life. What do you do? You put your own mask on first before you try to intercede with anybody else. The second thing, and we've talked a lot about this, I would suggest that you go back. Thank you, Chantal, for labeling all of our podcasts over the last year. Woot, woot, what a girl. And Go back to the establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries and limits because that's your second step. Make them come, make those boundaries and limits come from what you need. You need authentically. Okay, the third point to make is inside ourselves is that child no matter how jubilant they are and healthy and happy and whatever the best children can be or maybe not so much inside every one of us is that child so speak reassuringly to all parts of yourself all right that that inner dialogue remember how many times i've encouraged you to really really watch the self talk because what you say to yourself heavily, heavily influences the options you give yourself. So be gentle with yourself. That doesn't mean you get a hall pass for anything goes, all right? That just means no blame, no shame. That's pointless. And especially reassure that inner child because they are inside you right now. And remember, that that child, as well as the adult, benefits most, but especially the children, absolutely need unconditional love. They don't understand the conditions. They try to meet them, but they don't really understand. They incorporate that a whole different way, like somehow I have to be different from who I am. Maybe this is who I am. And then they become people pleasers. Are you a people pleaser? Okay, is there any element of that that's at work? So speak gently, respectfully, and reassuringly to yourself. And then remember that what you say to yourself and you integrate that little kid that's still inside you needs reassurance and needs unconditional love. Be patient with yourself, right? The only person, and this was always true and you're an adult now, now you're able to do this. As a child, you couldn't. The only person who can parent you perfectly is yourself. Your parents, as good, bad, or indifferent as they were, they can't understand you the way you understand yourself. So put a little time into it, folks. If you're gonna get those needs met, they might as well be your real needs. But first, you need to know yourself better. And you need to accept yourself as well. You're flawed, imperfect human beings, just like me. And that's just the way we're supposed to be. That's just the way we were intended to be. All right. I said this last week. I'll say it again. My motto to myself is there seems to be a limitless number of mistakes that I can make. My goal for myself is not to waste my life repeating them. Not to make the same mistake over and over and over and over again. What a waste of time that is. But tomorrow will bring another challenge and I may ace it or I may really do badly. What did I learn from it? What did I learn from it? Okay. So if when you, we talked last week about emotional flashbacks, if you have these recollections that are vague but intense, just let them be. If you have to isolate yourself somewhere, take now well, go off to the ladies' room, go off someplace where you've got a little bit of privacy. 
Don't fight it. Just let it flow through you. All right. If you fight it, you hold on to it. Just what is it? What is that about? What does that remind me of? And then as quickly as you can get back into your life today, ease yourself back into your body. Okay. Especially when those emotional flashbacks, even though they could only be an instant or something intense that doesn't make sense, big over, over abundance of fear, feeling insecure, worry overtakes you. Okay, fills your head. It can, particularly if you hold on to it, disrupt you. But sometimes the oddest thing, even a smell, okay, can trigger somebody, causing us to numb and space out. All right, because it's so sudden, it's surprising, it's shocking sometimes, a little disorienting. You feel like, am I caught in some kind of invasion of the body snatchers here and it can overwhelm us all right that loss of control can be beyond our limit uh, maybe we have at that moment a higher need for control resist the committee remember what we said as soon as the committee and the naysayers start na 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 get up and leave the meeting all right Say, yeah, I'll read the minutes. That's okay. You guys talk among yourselves. All right. Oh, nope. This does not suit me right now. Physically imagine a meeting where everybody's talking over one another and everybody has a different opinion. And worst of all, everybody thinks they're right. Okay. And you're sort of like, rah, 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 rah. oh my goodness. You know, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm indecisive. Like I'm, I'm blocked here. Off you go, find that spot. Might be the ladies' room. You might be spending a lot of time in the ladies' room in short bursts of time if you need it. You know what? Pick a cubicle. Try not to make it a one holer where you've got the whole room. You know, just go in your cubicle. Stop, regain, breathe. Feel, feel your feet on the floor. Feel your hands on something cold. Pick the back of the toilet. That that um, is going to be nice and cold from the water. Whatever needs to bring you back to here and now. All right, find what works for you. All right, make sure it is the ladies' room though. All right. Um, okay. So resist the inner critic. Say no to the mental critics. Leave the meeting, and at the same time, as you bring yourself back to the present. All right, by being mindful. Where am I? What day is this? This is not that day. This is not that experience. That event is in the past. I can deal with it later. It's not going to disrupt me right now and today. Replace the negative thinking. Now, I who last week in preparation for this week made their prepared list of your qualities, the ones you accept, the ones that people comment on and you know are true, and your accomplishments. Everybody has some. Never mind the date on them. If you did it and you accomplished it, it's yours forever. All right? You, you want to have that prepared list. I worked with a young woman Boy, she was brave. She was really, really, really impaired by complex, complex post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety, depression um, from narcissistic parenting to the point that it really was lovingly abusive. Um, and when we worked together, when she would get these bouts of insecurity or she's people are looking at her judging her like she was judging herself really it was a projection of her own feelings and fear that other people might be into the fact that she wasn't as secure as she seemed to be and she had she wanted to stay at work all right and so every day she get ready to go to work. Unfortunately, she had to take a bus. And so there were more than enough people on that bus. So one of the things we did was we prepared a list of qualities and a list of accomplishments. And her job 
was to keep that right at hand. And as she w approached the bus stop, when she could stop and wasn't going to trip over something, trying to read something, um, she would read her list. She just had them on little cue cards and she would read her list. And she would prepare herself for the fact that when I get on this bus, of course, people are going to look at me. That doesn't mean they're thinking what I'm thinking. That means I'm a new face. Who is this on my bus? All right. And they may also be trying to decide whether they're going to move over and make a space for you. That projection of other people are thinking about me. They, they know my insecurities because somehow it's tattooed all over me. It's not. Be really, really careful of the projections we make on other people when we're really not in the best space, space ourselves. I know myself that the times when I'm not feeling good enough about myself, I am far more critical of other people. And it's just a projection. I'm feeling critical of myself about something. And so that's the energy I have to give in that moment. Well, I learned now that some of that less than is warranted, but some of it is about me. It's not actually about the other person. Okay, just be aware when you flip into something, some behavior, particularly if it's internal, how much of it is about you? and how much of it is about the other guy. Okay, the next thing I wanna remind you of, after you've really worked to just quiet those cr critical voices, allow yourself to grieve, all right? Allow yourself to grieve. And think about those flashbacks, those memories, even if they're not quite flashbacks, those kind of reminders, you, you know, recollections. Think about those as an opportunity, right? An opportunity to release old unexpressed feelings. Now they're right in your mind and now they're available in fresh relief to have a look at as an adult in a safer place you probably today have more to offer resolving those. It's not the worst thing then if they are coming back in small drips, right? If they come back in small drips, you can better deal with them than you ever could when they were new to you and you were pretty unresourced, all right? So now you're more able to face your fears, okay? The next thing, we are social beings. And as social beings, we're not supposed to be alone for long periods of time, isolated, even if you're an introvert, all right? So cultivate safe, supportive relationships. Where are those people? Do you know where they are? And remember that those relationships need to, for them to be healthy, they need to be reciprocal. You can't always be on the accepting side, on the receiving side. You also need to be willing to give, all right, to keep those relationships healthy and alive. So, when you take time alone, just be aware, because many people tell me that they kind of cocoon, all right? And as they start to cocoon, they start to keep a lot of the things that they want to make their life a little more comfortable so they don't have to go up and get and go and get it so they don't have to put it away they keep those and that can build up around you particularly if you're someone who has developed the habit of hitting the couch whenever you don't feel well all right stay upright don't sleep on the couch Please don't sleep on the couch. That's a real sign of depression, all right? Stay upright. If you're gonna sit, sit 
upright, all right? And try to figure out the minimum number. We're in a harm reduction here now, okay? We're not gonna try to turn you around into a different person with different awareness, 100%. Just look around you, wherever you're sitting, if you're home, look around you and just see, are things starting to build up? Because it's easier to have X, Y, and Z around you like a cocoon, all right? So the books, the laptop, the Kleenex, the, the food, the snack food, the whatever it is, stay upright. All right, stay upright and watch. Give yourself, if you can, give yourself a limit of what you're going to allow, okay? We all cocoon a tiny bit. I know that when I'm going to binge watch my favorite show, three episodes or something at night, just to come down, I know I have my cuticle uh, scissors. I know I have my tooth, you know, those little things that you floss your teeth with, but you're not doing this. Um, I have that, you know, good dental hygiene. I have my hand lotion. Um, I have maybe three things on the table beside me. Whatever else I bring, the diet ginger ale, the glass, maybe a snack if I'm going to have one. I have a rule for myself. If I don't put it away at the time I'm using it, when I finish the show, then the next morning before I start anything, except my coffee, um, I have to put it away. That's my way of keeping myself honest with myself. I invite you to consider if any part of that is something that you could benefit from. And if it is, Put it into place. All right. Remember this. Your feelings aren't facts. My feelings aren't facts. But they might be an indicator of what's going right and what's going wrong at that point. However, no matter what they are, they do not define you now and they do not define your destiny. You always have the skills and abilities that you genuinely have. They don't go anywhere just because you're feeling bad. It might be like digging into the bottom of your purse, all right, or your valise. You gotta dig a little deeper for them, right? Because there's other stuff on top, but they're there, use them. Don't believe just because you feel badly that you don't have all of the skills and all of the abilities you always have on your best day. They're there. They're just at the bottom of your purse. Dig for them. Okay. Remember that the feelings we have are just feelings. All right. They're only telling us how we are actually processing something. That's what our feelings are about. How am I processing it? So on days when I don't feel that good about myself, I gain a few pounds or whatever it is. I'm having a bad hair day and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I got to go out and I look like a squirrel. All right. Whatever it is. That's about me. That is not about the truth. Okay. The other thing too is if part of the legacy of parenting and the sense you've made of it is shame. If you're somebody who goes to shame and self-blame quickly, all right? If you second guess yourself, if you second guess yourself, those feelings of shame are just the baseball that gets jettisoned into your backyard, all right? It's not you. You are not shameful. You're having a feeling because you're putting the meaning together, probably the way you were taught. All right? 
Shameful feelings, insecure feelings don't mean that you are inadequate or that you as an individual are shameful. You've got to separate that out. Feelings aren't facts. So instead of letting that shame or that insecurity get a hold on you and consume you and determine what you're going to approach what's in front of you with, including the 15 minutes a day to declutter or the picking up after yourself, all right, or the avoiding the pile by making its permanent place in your home no more than three to four steps, ideally, from where you use it so that you will be likely to put it back and prevent future buildup, whatever that is, all right, don't disable yourself with a feeling. A feeling is not reality. All right. Fear doesn't mean you're not brave. Insecurity is fear. That does not mean that you're not competent. It's just a feeling. Do a little of whatever you believe you need to do that's making you feel insecure, that's making you feel shameful or fearful. Do a little of it just to show it who's boss. You don't have to do the whole thing. You don't have to do it perfectly. Get up and face the demon down and do a little bit. Having trouble doing your 15 minutes a day? Get up and do five. You can, over a 15-minute period, do three periods of five minutes and march in place, looking at the stuff, talking to the stuff, make it real. I'm coming for you. Whatever you have to do to make yourself laugh, okay? Because you can't be afraid of something. You can't be afraid of something and feel like you are not able to do it if you can laugh at it. Make yourself laugh. Learning to make yourself laugh at something when it's genuine, seeing the humor in it, is a real energizer. There's nothing like being able to laugh at something, even yourself, all right, to give you energy and to also make it infinitely, infinitely manageable. Educate your closest friends. You know those people you're going to lean on when you're really not in a good place or blessed COVID. You are just feeling like, okay, I am so done. I know I'm an introvert, but really this is going to extremes. All right. I do not need any more time to myself. All right. I just need kind of, I'll even go and stand outside the grocery store. I won't go in. Okay. But I'll go and stand outside just to have people go by me. Okay, I'm still part of the world here, folks. How are you doing? Um, we're at that point. Let's tell ourselves the truth. All right, we are so at that point. Those closest friends, those people you're going to call that you're also going to give back to, educate them, tell them the truth. Don't overwhelm them. They're not your therapist, okay? But just let them tell you their, what I call, owies that parts of, of themselves that they're not entirely proud of, and it certainly wouldn't go on a resume, all right? And the parts of yourself that aren't your strongest features, all right? Share those, a little bit at a time. Educate them about those flashbacks. Having another one of those, don't remember, but you know what? Interesting uh, experience that I had. I was working with a, a young woman, I am working with a young woman quite intensively right now. And we were talking about emotional flashbacks. She was telling me about hers and I had one. And that was uh, my first memory. And my family, when I told them about it, my parents said, you can't remember that. That is just not possible. You were like a little under, like if you were two, that's all you were. And I have this really, vague kind of fuzzy but very clear odd contradiction memory of being all dressed up in a little hat and a little coat and of course my mother they would match and 
I'm standing there. I am no bigger than a minute. And I have somebody's hand, somebody on the left-hand side is holding my hand. And I'm standing, I, I can't see the steps, but I know I'm on steps. I'm on a wide, I think concrete step by the feel of it. And there are like a number of them laid out, not like a house would be. You'd have to be on three acres to have steps the way these feel. And it's a sunny day, but it's cool. It's, it's kind of chilly, actually. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm okay because I have somebody's hand. And my father came back from, I was telling people on Remembrance Day about my dad. My dad came back from the Second World War a year and a half after because he stayed over on reconnaissance duty and um, in Germany and in Holland. Uh, somehow he contacted TB. When he came back, it was a year and a half after most of uh, the uh, soldiers were coming back, and somehow, um, somehow the, the medical was missed. The, the re-entry medical was missed. It was another six months to a year before um, he was walking across the parade grounds and the medical officer happened to be passing was in. Virtual, I want to see you. You don't look so good. And so he had to go in and see the, the medical officer. Turned out he um, had TB seriously and he had lost one whole lung and half of another. All right. So he was in the sanatorium um, for a long time um, getting treatment for TB. Of course, that meant that all of us had to be tested. And typical. I got to be the unusual one. Um, on my lung, there was like a feather scar. It turned out to not be TB, but for quite a period of time, um, I had to be in the baby unit at the SAM, um, where, now that's a sad story, but I'm going to give you a a funny ending, uh, which is also true. I don't have a recollection of this, but that memory I have is me being taken in to uh, the sanatorium. Um, and so I remember that. I was like maybe just two. And um, so in the sanatorium, um, I earned the nickname my mother gave me, just to show you no family is perfect. My childhood nickname was Dennis. Yes, you're right, for Dennis the Menace. And I earned it because in the sanatorium, Dr. Lehman was in visiting my dad. He was one of the uh, doctors there, and he happened to be in my father's room at the time when the whole sanatorium went into darkness, pitch black dark. And my father said, oh, I just know Elaine has something to do with this. And it turned out that somebody had put my crib close to the wall and there was an electrical socket. And to make me feel not alone, somebody gave me a monkey with wire legs. And I managed to get the fabric off the bottom of the legs. Nobody noticed. And so this looks like this will fit. And luckily I wasn't injured, but I put the whole sanatorium, this is a big hospital, the whole sanatorium in darkness. And I guess my father really knew me because he's reported to have said, oh dear, I just know Elaine's involved in this somehow. Dad was always right. So sometimes those vague memories are flashbacks. Sometimes they're happy, funny things. Sometimes they're just sort of benign things. That's okay. Trust them, all right? If they get overwhelming, if they are disruptive and disorienting, please get help with them. They don't have to define your destiny. They are intruders. They are intruders that can be managed. Okay. All right. The next thing I want you to remember is if you're aware that these things are happening, do continue to happen, try to identify the types of things that trigger you into these flashbacks. And don't dismiss a sense of smell. Sense of smell is a very powerful trigger. 
for things, all right, for association. Figure out if you can by just staying calm, reminding yourself you're safe, whatever the feeling is, whatever the emotion is, you're, it was then, it can't hurt you now. It can't hurt you now. But the more light that you can shine on it, the more you can take it back and you can put a proper context around it, which then will provide a layer of safety. Validate them, though. These are just attempts to validate an experience that you did have. You may be putting two and two together and getting five. Maybe the memory isn't 100% clear. Just know that it's the truth. It's the truth, but you don't have to be afraid of it, all right? Don't go to fear, go to fact. Whenever you feel disrupted, never go to fear, go to fact, all right? Catch yourself, don't let yourself go down that bobsled, all right? Because that sense of being out of control, particularly, if it's associated with not being good enough, all right, then we'll fast forward and be incorporated as truth. This is evidence. I have a feeling. And you bring it forward into the present. It doesn't belong in the present. You're not the same person. No matter whether it's 10 years in the past, 20 years in the past, it doesn't matter. Five years in the past, it doesn't matter. You're a different person today. And clearly, you're more skilled and more aware, or you wouldn't be attending this podcast. All right? You have more skin in the game now, folks. All right? You have what it takes. If it's coming up, it's an opportunity to face the demon down and to put it to bed, pack it up, leave it where it belongs in the past. It's a process, though. So if it gets disruptive, please reach out for help. Okay. The other thing too, it can also be a really good indicator, a really sound indicator of what you actually need today in the here and now. You don't have to sit there in okayness thinking, I have no idea what I need. If these little messages are coming from the past to say, what about us? We're not finished. That's what they are. What about me? It's not finished. I need help with this. Give it the help it needs. Okay. Hey, right. the other thing I mentioned this before, be patient. Recovery takes the time it takes. You can speed it up a little. You can make it sounder if you get help for working through this process. There's nothing like feeling safe and supported, all right, to make you braver and to give you more energy and to clear away a lot of the debris, all right, that you don't have to wade through then, okay? But it is a gradual process and you want it to be gradual. Often narcissistic parents make their children feel shamed because instead of teaching them that their actions were wrong, the choice they made were wrong, children always are susceptible to believing it's about them. The message, whether the parents said it that way or did say it that way or not, all right, the child is going to come out of that believing that they as an individual, as an entity, they're wrong. As a person, there's something wrong. That wrong gets digested, all right? Instead of helping the child to understand, that, you know what, it's okay to make mistakes, but it's important not to repeat them and it's important to learn from them. But you're not a mistake. You're, and the angrier parents are, the more disrupted parents are, all right, the more likely they are to forget that last piece. This isn't about you as a person. You're precious, you're worthwhile, you're worthy, you're loved, but this thing you've done doesn't cut it. Okay, 
What do you need to learn not to do that thing that is not okay? Most parents, most parents don't do that 100%. The other thing about a narcissistic parent, though, is they have an additional disadvantage. The degree to which they exhibit and live with narcissistic traits is the degree to which they lack empathy for others. Okay, and high, high probability that they project and you as a child or other children, and even in a family, all right, you can have 10 children. They all have different needs. They all have different strengths. They all have different perceptions. The same behavior can have a different effect on your brothers and sisters. So if you're okay and they're not okay, just respect the fact it's because of the difference. Nobody's lying. Nobody's making it up. Nobody's being dramatic. Okay. Your recovery. We're going to talk about this in, in the next 15 minutes. Your recovery is a three-step process, all right? First is you need to understand the problem. That's why it's worth when, flat, when you're lucky enough to have these reminders, so long as they're not vivid and terrifying or really disruptive, they're an opportunity to better understand something from the past that is still bobbing along somewhere inside you, okay, and needs dealing with. It's an opportunity. Take the time to kind of try to flesh it out. What other impressions uh, do you have? You do that by getting background information. So for instance, with my, what I think was, it, it did have a visual component. So I think it was a true flashback as opposed to just an emotional one, but I had an emotional content to it as well. I asked, okay, was there ever a time when I had like a little hat that had a peak on it, like a little girl's hat here, and I had a coat. I couldn't see the hat and coat. I just knew they were there and they matched. And I was standing out somebody by the hand on a set of big, like big steps. And of course, my parents looked at each other like, and said, can't be, you can't remember that. I asked for more information. Look for the context, okay? Context is everything. Context defines it. So there would have been a lot of meaning I could have applied to that flashback, right? Could have been good, bad, terrible, could have been... Oh, I was on my way to the queen on a party. You know, I could have been anything. I'm all dressed up. I must have been going somewhere. It was important to get the truth. So by adding context, you're not looking for them to validate it. You're looking for them to fill in the colors so that you can make some sense, more sense of it yourself. Okay. Step two, you allow yourself to process the feelings associated with that first step. As you get more information. All I had in the beginning was a vague, I'm, I'm little, 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 and my hand is up like this, probably not in school because I'm just a munchkin. I have this, so it was outside. I wouldn't have the hat and coat on. I had a sense that it was cool. All right. I had a sense that it was like a wide expanse and I was looking out like this. It was getting the context and the background, asking for more information that helped me process. Ah, so my hand up, I had somebody by the hand. That's why it's not a fearful thing to be so little out, looking out on this great abyss. I wasn't law. There were a lot of other meanings I could have put to it, right? Don't be afraid to ask, but make sense of it yourself. The third thing is push through understandably if negative fearful whatever negative feelings come up there's going to be a big temptation to want to skip this step <laughs> like okay let's just move on to step four um push through it do whatever you have to do remind yourself you are an adult this is today your feet are on the floor right here this you are not back there this is safe it's like watching 
a movie play out in front of you. Externalize it, see it. All right? Okay. Try to resist the urge to skip the making sense and pushing through. Let yourself feel whatever you feel. All right? The degree to which parenting was narcissistic may have taught you to invalidate your feelings, to ignore them, to minimize them. You're just being dramatic. Everybody else is okay. I don't know what's wrong with you. All right, whatever it is, whatever those messages were, you have become the degree to which you don't trust and validate your own feelings. They're feelings. This is, you're not going to go out and make a career based on these feelings. You're not going to, to invest to the extent that it changes your life trajectory, these feelings. You became disenfranchised from your own needs, from your own feelings. Take it back. Take it back. All right? That inadvertent side effect of a narcissistic parent is to disenfranchise you from your needs and your feelings because it was all about them. It was all about what they said. It was all about, and narcissistic parents too can be very, very manipulative, all right? Little kid isn't ready, just does not have the developmental strategies to deal with being manipulated if you think sometimes like you're going crazy like you, you don't know what's real what's not real chances are somebody pulled a hocus pocus on you that's called manipulation what do you feel that's the best you've got right now to work on work from it if it's overwhelming if it's really disruptive to you reach out and get help won't be forever, okay? Help or counseling or therapy or support is not a lifeline that you're going to hold on to forever. It's now. It's about this thing, okay? So you should know that processing feelings, though, is very different from talking about them. Processing means that to talk about the events, you allow yourself to remember the impressions and the feelings you had, even if they're vague. It's processing is a two-part thing. It's good to externalize it. I strongly believe in talking to myself because when I hear myself say it out there, it occupies time and space. There's no taking it back. And when I say it and share it with another person who I trust, I now have a witness to my truth. There's no taking it back. That person can invalidate it. When I want to go and hide because I don't want to feel it, I don't want to think it, okay, I don't want to remember it, it now occupies, it's real, it occupies time and space. That person now can be prepared to support me, to say, no, whatever's getting in the way right now that you've kind of, you want to go back into hiding about this, stay with me, just stay out here, you're safe. It's not then, it's now. And it's coming up and you're talking about it because you're brave enough to face the demon down. What we imagine and what we are afraid of is always worse than the event, all right? Particularly if it happened in childhood because everything feels bigger than the child and you have that child inside you still only with the support you feel you need okay is processing as effective so you can release this from your body and then step three is about reframing it so it's not about lying to yourself and calling it something else reframing is really about looking at a problem or a situation with another valid perspective it's valid what happened is valid because it happened but there might be more to the story that is also true and valid and the truth the context will help you 
deal with it as an adult, not stay in your child state, reacting to it and being intruded by it, okay? It's, it's an advantage. When you begin to see things differently, you're adding to the context, the context of everything, all right? is that is the valid meaning for the truth of the event. That does not mean, even if there were reasons why your parent, even if there was illness, even if it was called something else, even if it was excused, all right? The context around how and why that was happening is true. It's also true. That does not change the effect on you. Don't go to that child state and disenfranchise yourself from the feelings and the impact it had on you. That's true as well. There can be more than one truth at the same time in a situation. Your truth and the larger con in the context of the larger event. All right. But you're an adult. If you're here listening to this podcast, I'm betting that there's something you want to understand the context about. The context is just, and the, the impact on you is just the baggage are associated with the damaging experience. And that's what you want to unload. You want to unload the baggage you're carrying and begin, okay, to be more free from it. It can't intrude on you then. And this makes emotional, your current emotional space, all right, to begin to get in touch with your real feelings, not the feelings you're allowed to have, or just the biggest feelings that poke through the barrier you have up. It also is going to help you find your own values, your own belief systems, what you stand for, not being held hostage by the committee not being disrupted by all those voices, okay, that are talking over you. All right. The truth is the truth. That's why so many people say, I don't know what I need. I don't really know how I feel. Generally, it was because there was no point in having feelings. There was no point in having needs. Maybe you got some met, but that was by, by luck, not design. And nobody, it doesn't mean that people didn't love you. It just means if it happened consistently, consistently, they didn't have it to give for whatever reason. Narcissism is one of them. Okay. There are other reasons as well. Now, next week, we're going to move to this topic. Okay. The um, healing, the un mothered child. We've been talking about parents now. Now we're going to move into mother. All right. This is not to disparage our mothers. This is not to find fault and blame. This is to understand. This is to understand the larger context. And the two sources we're going to use, as well as my clinical experience, because the reason I'm bringing this topic up, it's because this impacts what you give yourself permission to do, what you think you're worthy of, the energy you have. If your energy is all being used up with things from the past or clearing away debris, you know, incoming, and it's living out in patterns that really aren't good for you, and you don't deserve to be stuck in the past. If that's what's happening, let's look at whether some of it was the unmothered child. The sources we're going to use, as well as my experience, um, are Carl, K-A-R-Y-L, if anybody's interested, McBride, M-C, B-R-I-D-E, P-H-D, and Carolyn, with a C, Foster. Maybe you want to look those up online. So I'm just going to take a very quick stop through acceptance, okay? When we talk about acceptance, we need to consider the following. Just want to give you a heads up. We're not going to go into detail. We'll go into more detail next podcast. 
accepting your mother's limitations, all right? And allowing yourself to grieve for what you didn't get as a result. Separating yourself as an adult now psychologically from your mother and reframing, adding that larger true valid context to the negative messages that you got, you may still be getting. Working on your authentic sense of self. Who are you? You're in there. Okay. Just let it out. Be true to yourself. Sounds like new age stuff. It isn't. You came into this world. You were given life. You weren't meant to be living it in the past. Dragging along tons of baggage that every so often starts to smell and you kind of pick up a signal. Okay, it's time to leave the garbage back there. Okay, because you don't smell. The smell isn't you. The insecurity isn't you, all right? Dealing with mother and your relationship with her in a healthy way as an adult, regardless of whether she's still with you, regardless of whether she's the same person she always was, and she's at the far end of the spectrum of narcissism. doesn't matter. If you still have a mother and you choose to interact with her, she may be the same way. You can still be healthy. All right? Her choice doesn't determine your choice. I can remember saying to my mother, she wasn't narcissistic, but I can remember being wise enough as an adult to say to my mother, now, mind you, I had two children by the time I did this, so it was a little later on in life, and but I woke, and I remember saying to her, there are three things. We kept getting into arguments, and I realized later, I don't want to argue with my mother, but neither do I want to capitulate, and so... I kind of put my thinking cap on, hadn't read this book, did this, and I thought to myself, you know, there are three, there are three topics that are just going nowhere fast, all right? So I am better to set boundaries and limits around those and exclude those topics. So I went in one day and I said to my mother as she started talking about it, because these were frequent topics, and I said to her, I just want to give you a heads up. I said, there are three topics we are not going to discuss. She looked at me and I said, Highland dancing is one of them. Sex is the other. And religion. Not talking about any of those. And she said, why? I said, because we get into trouble when we do it. Because you're you and I'm me and never the twain shall meet. And it's occurred to me, unless we want to be fighting forever, quarreling okay you have to stay away from those well and I said and the other thing I've decided because my mother was Irish um the other thing I've decided and I just want to give you a heads up so you're not offended this is when I developed the rule of three the first time it comes up I'm just going to raise the topic no okay the second time it comes up in the same conversation okay I'm going to kind of warn you this is something we're not talking about okay if the third time it comes up did I mention she was Irish um the third time it comes up I'm going to get up and leave because the alternative and I'm not don't be offended thinking how can you control that don't be offended I said because the alternative is we're going to end up arguing or quarreling and I'm not doing that anymore one day I go in, just to show you it's not always a smooth road. Sometimes you actually have to use the boundaries and limits. Okay? It's good to know it, but sometimes you actually have to use them. One day I went in and the topic of Highland dancing came up. I said, remember, we're not talking about that. That was an easy one for her to let go of. I knew she'd come back to it, but that day it was okay. Second was something about religion. All right. And I said, Remember, that's another one that we're not talking about. 
And then she said, oh, I just remembered it. She came back to Highland Dancing. And I went, I have to go now. I love you, but I have to go now. And I picked up and I left. I picked, picked the kids up with me and I left. And she's standing there going. And I said, don't be offended. Better than a quarrel. And off I went. You can love somebody. They can still not get it or take it seriously. All right. Once you know your boundaries and limits, practice them with love and respect. They're your boundaries and limits. You're allowed to have them. Anytime somebody puts you in a situation where you're being pushed in a pattern. Now, I respectfully suggest that the rule of three is not the worst thing if you don't have your own guidelines, all right? First time is an accident. You didn't mean it. The second time is a coincidence. Maybe you didn't understand or I wasn't clear. And the third time is a pattern. We're going to solve it now because I'm not living through this in perpetuity. I want to leave you with that. Practice it this week. And I will see you next week. Take care, everyone. And I will, I will now save all the questions. And we will start maybe or incorporate one whole session where we go through all the questions. Okay? You take care. See you next week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Happy Have to. Day. Thanks. You too. Take care, Elaine. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome.